Welcome to The Local Loop, Episode 1. I'm Aubrey King with Dev Central, and joining me this month, we've got Jalal Yunus. Operational benefit uh, plus the benefit from the perspective of flexibility. And Lockwinder Singh. Service function chaining is a new introduction in 5G, but it's not a new concept to industry. This month, we will be discussing 5G service chaining at the core. So strap on those earbuds and get ready for The Local Loop, where the provider meets the community. Thank you guys for joining me today. And if you could give the community a quick introduction. Thanks for the opportunity, Aubrey. My name is uh, Jalal Yunus. I'm associated with TELUS. I'm a senior network design engineer. Uh, my main areas of responsibility uh, are around developing new solution architectures, uh, integrating them into our core network, and then operationalizing the new services. So essentially, it's a, it's a top-down role wherein we build the service profiles, and then uh, we also have a responsibility as a group to develop certain capabilities at the network level, which can be transformed into service features. So that's what I've been doing for uh, almost 10 years with TELUS. Hello, thanks, Aubrey, uh, for having us. Um, my name is Lukwinder Singh. I'm a solutions engineer with uh, F5. So my core interest uh, in this space is mostly how do we solve problems on N6 side, uh, help Jalal and team get their requirements and translate to our product team and, and help our product team to evolve the product as uh, Jalal and team and tell us, uh, you know, is expecting. I have had developed a keen interest in uh, this space, especially on IPU, IDU side and uh, how, how can we leverage open technologies like OPID for and uh, uh, how can we build this ecosystem that is more scalable on the 5G side. First of all, I guess, what is service chaining and how are we uh, getting it done today? Yeah, so service chaining is not a new concept, Aubrey. We've been using this in the IP transport domain for a number of years and obviously in the SD-WAN domain as well. So it's it's essentially uh, a process wherein uh, we decompose our complex uh, service delivery platforms into their respective modular, simple service constructs. Uh, let's call them microservices for the lack of a better word. And then uh, we basically order them either loosely or strictly, and then we start steering traffic towards these individual functions that are distributed across your network. From 5G or 4G network perspective, obviously in 5G network, you have what we call an N6 interface, which is facing, uh, you know, the core facing interface uh, to external networks and the 4G PC core, you have it uh, as an SGI LAN interface. So typically these functions would reside in that domain. And then you would have a software defined control mechanism, crafting policies for the data plane to be able to steer the traffic towards uh, these functions. And then obviously there is a benefit of all this, uh, there's an operational benefit. Uh, the insertion or removal of individual functions becomes much more easier because now you have full control over the architecture through orchestration and automation. And uh, it reduces the blast radius to an extent as well uh, because you, you basically have duplicate instances of your functions uh, implemented in sort of a linear chain uh, and if one function dies, it basically signals uh, its demise to the control plane. And then the control plane sort of excludes that function uh, from its forwarding plane policies. So operational benefit uh, plus the benefit from the perspective of flexibility uh, in a nutshell is what service chaining uh, amounts to. As Jalal mentioned, this is uh, not a new concept, but we are using this concept in 5G as every generation of uh, networks brought new capabilities and functions starting from you know 1G, 2G, and 3G and 4G was very data intensive and application exploded. In 5G, we're gonna have billions of devices connected 
We're going to have multiple use cases that we need to enable on demand. And to do all of this, we need new concepts. And service chaining is one of those concepts that's going to help us to do the scaling that we need in 5G world and the connectivity that we need. And as Jalal mentioned, you know, there are these are concepts that actually decouple data plane from control plane, and you actually manage everything from control plane, and then data plane is stateless, which which is a big, big uh, uh, issue in 4G, where we use ECMP or load balancer based technologies to you know hash the, the the traffic and pass it through the the value added functions that Jalal mentioned. So service function chaining is a new introduction in 5G, but it's not a new concept to industry. And you, I mean, you know me, I, I do love ECMP. Yes. So how, how are we doing that today? How, how are providers in general accomplishing service chaining today in the 5G core? I think if you look at uh, service chaining or service interleaving as a concept when applied to the wireless network, normally uh, the process is such that uh, you would have certain number of workloads uh, hosted closer to the data plane component of your wireless core, which is in 4G parallels is the packet gateway. And in the 5G space, it's called uh, the UPF or user plane function. And then you basically have a very straightforward mechanism, pretty simple forwarding mechanism, uh, wherein the UPF or the packet gateway just needs to route traffic to the upstream uh, function. That function then obviously is front-ended by a reverse proxy type load balancer, which essentially load balances the traffic towards uh, your downstream functions hosted either uh, in the cloud or uh, in an NFVI or a network function virtualization environment and then you rely on these functions to process the traffic. The problem is that once they've processed the function, they must pivot the traffic back to the switching layer, which basically is uh, stitching the, the disparate domains together. So in this case, you receive the traffic uh, onto a certain function. The function processes the traffic and sends it back to the switching layer. Switching layer then forwards it or extends the traffic to the next function. And the next function, if it is a non-transparent function, like a firewall, it will perform or implement constructs like carrier grade NAT and then let the traffic go out towards the external networks. So on the reverse path, the traffic obviously needs to follow the same uh, hops. Otherwise, the, the stateful nature of the flows would be disrupted. So this is how you would do it in uh, a standard environment where you have different types of workloads. You may have containerized workloads uh, in form of your wireless core components, uh, the data plane components. Then you may have these individual functions uh, sitting on an isolated silo of compute infrastructure. And then you may have your appliance-based workloads like firewalls participating in the service interleaving arrangement. So technically, this is how you would have, and then you would basically have load balancers in front of your functions performing, you know, advanced load balancing uh, capabilities. So, or offering advanced load balancing capabilities towards these downstream functions. So traditionally, uh, we were heavily dependent on load balancers as the nature of traffic passing through N6. It has to be stateful. And if uh, a function, which is a VM in traditional 4G uh, terminology or its uh, appliance, that appliance, if it passes traffic from left to right, meaning from UE to internet, that return traffic should pass through the same appliance or, or a virtual machine, which was putting a lot of stress on the network. And we were actually passing the same traffic two, three, four times through the load balancer, which was making things uh, uh, difficult to scale uh, because of the stateful nature of the traffic that's passing through it. And second, it was getting very hard to to actually scale the networks uh, uh, with that architecture. The scaling has to be independent, right? So the control plane uh, functions should stay in the control plane of 5G, and the data plane should stay in in the, uh, on the N6 side. So 
with with the with the introduction of segment routing and with the intro, introduction of service function chaining we are actually making our uh, networks scalable and by using things like uh, or technologies like kubernetes we are making our functions scalable as well by using the 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 well proven technology like kubernetes uh, in this uh, in this concept you know lockwinter i guess since since this is the kind of the way that we're doing it today how are uh, how are you know vendors for the core evolving their ecosystem? So from a FI perspective, we have been a player in N6 space uh, as uh, our DNA is load balancing. We have been load balancing these functions and we have been doing it in 4G space and even in 5G space uh, with the initial setup, we are deploying these functions. But we are evolving uh, with the new architectures, we are building application functions. If you know 5G terminology, application functions are extension to the 5G core uh, components. So we are building an application function that will uh, make a decision on finding the chains. So when I say chains, meaning let's say Aubrey runs a critical business and he needs security functions over uh, over 5G, meaning you want to go through firewall, you want to go through DPI, IPS, all your traffic has to pass through these uh, critical functions. So our application function will talk to session management function and will talk to uh, you know UDM, will get your profile and will push the policy to a classifier and this classifier will add SRV6 headers into your packet, right? So IPv6, we use extensions in IPv6 header, and these extensions, we put all these uh, uh, IPv6 addresses in that particular extension, and then network will find the functions for you. This way, we are not putting stress on one single load balancer, but we are letting uh, um, network to find functions and scale the, the, the stuff. So going back to my example, this way we can enable new use cases uh, on 5G where uh, customer specific functions can be enabled and customer specific functions can be independently scaled. So from F5 perspective, we are building these solutions uh, which are SRV6 uh, uh, specific and which are which will be using IPUs and DPUs to do this classification and label the, the packets that are passing uh, or that are destined to N6. I'll just quickly add a few things, Aubrey. Uh, what we see as uh, service providers happening in the vendor space is that uh, most vendors are choosing to go towards host-based communication infrastructure. So service function chaining, uh, obviously, uh, you have to host your functions on a high-performance compute infrastructure. And if that compute infrastructure provides you with communication capability intrinsically, then obviously it's a, it's a game changer. This concept around disaggregation, distribution, or distributed and disaggregated designs within the core, especially at the edge of the 5G core, is also a very important motivation or impetus behind uh, this evolution that is taking place. So by disaggregation, I mean that you are separating large appliance-based solutions into their respective modular microservices. You're, you're basically distributing them and then sort of confederating the, the functionality to be able to implement a more complex architecture uh, in a very sort of simplified way. Uh, so that's, uh, that is what uh, has been happening in the vendor space uh, with the introduction of segment routing, which is essentially uh, an advanced or simplified traffic engineering mechanism to stay the traffic uh, traffic flows at will from one point to the other. So just just to add more sort of uh, uh, perspective to what uh, Lakwinder so eloquently shared with us here. What problems does this solve o over time uh, as we evolve the the architecture here? So it basically allows service providers to have the flexibility of inserting or removing functions at will. So service chaining coupled with automation orchestration uh, within the data plane, as well as you know, using more advanced forwarding plane mechanisms like or forwarding protocols like segment routing, uh, allow us to, to do that uh, going forward. So that is 
probably the biggest value add we see. Yeah, and um, uh, as Jalal mentioned, I mean, uh, one of the biggest challenges we have been solving with NFB is efficiently using or reusing the hardware, right? So uh, on the way we were building these uh, uh, these networks was with uh, racking and stacking servers and monolith approach and having purpose-built uh, uh, hardware. And then as soon as you're done with that hardware, you have to take it off and then put a new one, which was adding a lot of stress on CapEx and OpEx budgets that we, we had uh, planned for the networks. And with this new approach, uh, we can efficiently use the hardware. We can efficiently uh, make use of technologies like IPUs, DPUs, smart NICs, which can process the packet on the interface and give you the line speed that you need, plus, if you want to rebuild or let's say you're not happy with a one vendor firewall and you want to deploy a vendor two firewall, it's easy to switch because now your ecosystem has all the automation that you need. Your ecosystem is built mostly on Kubernetes and your ecosystem is scalable, independently scalable and, and swappable. So with this, we are actually solving the critical problems that telcos were facing and especially on the scaling and introdu- introduction of new services on demand. Okay. Uh, well, I guess, can you walk me through uh, just what a typical implementation would look like for service chaining? Uh, from F5 perspective, we, we started with, like, there are many building blocks for service chaining. First, you need service functions on N6. And these service functions are value-added services, for example, firewalling, CGNAT, DPI, IPS, DNS, and list goes on and on, depending on your use case, right? So from a F5 perspective, we have invested and we have created uh, cloud-native network functions from scratch. And these network functions can be hosted on OpenShift or Robin.io. And you can scale them, you can make use of custom resource definitions, all the Kubernetes concepts you, you can make use of to deploy these, to scale them. So basically, we build these functions to make use of Kubernetes as a common orchestration layer. And then uh, these functions will evolve and we will start supporting SRV6 onto these functions, which will help us to stitch things together, meaning in the network, we're going to label packets with SRV6 headers, and then they're going to pass through these different service chains or the service functions. And these functions will process the packet, apply all the logic that, that is required, and then will take out the, the header from, from the extensions and pass it to the next function. So from F5 perspective, we are heavily investing in this space, and it's, it's kind of our, our sweet spot, and we have been doing this from years. So Lockwinder, real quick, um, will our user, uh, I know our user community will want to know the answer to this. Do you know, can those CNFs also be deployed uh, on the distributed cloud app stack today? Uh, yes, we can. We can deploy um, because they are CNFs. They 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 are built for Kubernetes, so they theoretically they can be deployed on any Kubernetes uh, version. But uh, to okay. get the scale, to get the scale, we need SRIOV. Uh, we need multis because we need multiple interfaces. Um, so today, we support OpenShift and Robin.io, but unofficially or or unsupported way we we have deployed it on distributed cloud and they can be deployed on distributed cloud as well now for the community perspective jalal what do you have anything to to add to that in terms of the implementation and and kind of how we would walk through a typical implementation of service chaining sure i mean we we as service providers uh, have taken a platform based approach towards service chaining what that essentially means is that you basically disaggregate your service planes. Uh, so you have to have a management plane, which would basically be the overarching uh, you know, management layer for your underlying control and data plane components. Uh, this management plane uh, obviously would need to have open interfaces to external orchestration tools. It needs to have the capability of integrating with wireless core control plane. It must also support uh, the integration with a disparate public or private cloud hosted telemetry repository. Uh, And then obviously another important facet from implementation perspective is to have a dedicated control plane, which must be software defined because these complex segment routing or forwarding policies along with 
subscriber profile related data that would need to be pulled out of the wireless control plane, somehow we would have to, to sort of collapse everything into a policy. So all these disparate pieces of information coming from different domains would need to be converged and aggregated at the control plane layer. And this control plane would then send or proliferate these intelligent forwarding policies on a per subscriber basis towards the data plane. And within the data plane, at, as Lequinder alluded to, we would use a more advanced sort of uh, traffic engineering mechanism, which is based on segment routing, which is essentially a source forwarding based protocol. Now, obviously as a service provider, generally speaking, we would not like to push MPLS deep into the data plane for service chaining platform. Uh, that is why the tendency is to use a simple data plane based on IPv6 forwarding. So your control plane essentially will, will have an SDN controller developing or creating these uh, segment routing policies and pushing them downstream, acting as a path computation engine. And then the data plane would have componentry uh, in form of host-based communication infrastructure hosting routing daemons that support segment routing-based forwarding to forward the traffic uh, across the, the data plane. Uh, and then along the path, you also need to collect telemetry. And one predominant implementation protocol that we are seeing in the industry is inbound network telemetry. You could still employ gRPC, GNMI type protocols to, to pull telemetry information, but th these are agent-based protocols. Uh, whereas in-band network telemetry is uh, is a more robust, non-agent-based, uh, metadata-based approach, wherein you uh, you know you have a source of telemetry information, then you have a sync uh, for telemetry information, and then you tag the packets uh, of interest with regards to what type of information from telemetry perspective you would like to glean from that packet, and then make intelligent decisions based off of that information through the control plane, because you feed that information into your SDN controller, which then uh, real time uh, uses this information, telemetry information to craft a more substantial forwarding plane policy. So that's how we see things happening uh, from implementation perspective, more or less. Thank you guys for joining me today. And definitely thank you so much, Jalal, for jumping in and being uh, our first guest on this podcast. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Aubrey. Thanks a lot. Thanks for joining us today for The Local Loop. The Local Loop is a podcast produced by Dev Central, the F5 community, as a service provider companion piece with our flagship podcast, Dev Central Connects. Thanks and have a great F5 day.